everyone this afternoon for this uh, fantastically exciting lecture from uh, uh, Jennifer Dudnog. Um, I'm director of the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics. The Center for Personalized Medicine is, is part of that uh, uh, in, in, with St. Anne's College and Helen King. Together we chair the uh, steering group of, of the CPM. And uh, without further ado, there's uh, uh, an introduction from the Stanley Hall Foundation who support this lectureship. Hello, and welcome to the Oxford Center for Personalized Medicine lecture by Professor Jennifer Downer, in honor of the memory of Dr. Stanley Ho. I am Ian Hewan, a trustee of the Dr. Stanley Ho Medical Development Foundation and CEO of the Atorum Group, a NASDAQ-listed biotech company. The foundation aims to enhance the quality of medical service and delivery in Macau, Hong Kong, and other regions of China, and enters into academic partnerships with relevant worldwide organizations to achieve this. It is our pleasure to have supported the Oxford Center for Personalized Medicine since 2013. The University of Oxford Center for Personalized Medicine is based at St. Anne's College and the Wellcome Center for Human Genetics, UK. Its principal aim is to engage a wide range of interested people, including academics, clinicians, students, patient groups, and the public with personalized medicine. Dr. Ho's support for the center marks his vision and commitment to help transfer knowledge of personalized medicine to healthcare professionals and students worldwide. Dr. Seni Ho passed away in Hong Kong at the age of 98 on May 26, 2020. He was not only an extraordinary leader, but also a great philanthropist. His legacy is his extensive altruistic efforts from disaster relief to epidemic control, having helped shape the communities and lives of many who have been touched by his generosity. I have lost a lifelong mentor. But the foundation and I will honor Dr. Ho's memory by continuing his spirit of serving our communities. It gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Jennifer Down. She's the Lee Ka-shing Chancellor Chair Professor in the Department of Chemistry in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Downer has been a leading figure in the CRISPR revolution for her fundamental work and leadership in developing CRISPR-mediated genome editing. In 2012, Professor Downer and Emmanuel Charpentier were the first to propose the CRISPR-Cas9 could be used for programmable editing of genomes which is now considered one of the most significant discoveries in the history of biology. They were, they were awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in chemistry for the pioneering work. Professor Downer, it is my pleasure to welcome you as the inaugural Oxford CPM's Dr. Stanley Ho Memorial Lecturer. It's a great, Pleasure to be here virtually. I am delightful, uh, delighted to, to be part of this extraordinary lectureship and to be the, the inaugural lecturer. It's really incredible legacy of Dr. Stanley Ho and I'm delighted to honor that. I'm uh, going to share the slides. And um, I wanted to, start off by, uh, first of all, just uh, uh, acknowledging Oxford and, and thanking them for organizing this as a virtual lecture. It was planned originally to be, of course, uh, at Oxford, and we hope that will be possible again in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, I'm delighted to share with you some of the science that we've been doing in the laboratory. And I thought I would uh, break the talk into three parts. I wanna tell you first, a bit about the backstory of CRISPR. It's kind of an interesting example of the serendipity of small science, really, um, in discovering something completely unexpected in nature 
and then uh, how it could be harnessed for a tech, as a technology for genome editing. And that's what I'll talk about in the second part. And then um, in the rest of the talk, I wanna tell you a bit about some of the research we're currently doing to understand how the CRISPR technology works and importantly, how it can be deployed for clinical use. And I'm excited to, to say that there are already clinical trials underway using CRISPR and I'll say a bit about the, the uh, status of that work as well. So, uh, you know, CRISPR is a tool that allows genomes to be edited in a programmable way. And I'll say a little bit about what that means. What you're looking at here is a representation of the CRISPR-Cas9 protein in green with a molecule of RNA in yellow that provides the zip code, the molecular guide that allows this protein with its RNA to interact with double-stranded DNA and trigger double-stranded DNA cutting. And I have a, a, a video that illustrates exactly how this works. So we have Cas9 with its guide RNA engaged with a molecule of DNA. And if you watch, you'll see the DNA get cut. And so this is a, this is a system that is used in bacteria as a programmable adaptive immune system that allows bacteria to fight infection. And that's in fact how the technology was identified in the first place was by a small set of scientists who were studying this uh, bacterial immune system to try to understand how it worked. And so going back to the mid 2000s, there was some interesting suggestive research primarily from bioinformaticians at the time, including uh, Francisco Mojica in Spain who identified DNA sequences in bacteria that were uh, adapting in real time as bacteria became exposed to bacteriophage or viruses. And this was a tip off that there might be a mechanism by which these bacteria could store genetic information from viruses in their own genomes and then somehow use it to protect cells from future infection. So this is a, 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 a video that illustrates how we now understand that CRISPR works. And so you, you can see bacteria growing, uh, say in a biofilm and upon infection by a phage, if the bacterium has a CRISPR sequence in the genome, it can acquire a new sequence of viral uh, DNA and integrate it into this special place in the genome where each viral sequence is inserted between a DNA, a repetitive DNA element. The cell makes an RNA copy of that, that CRISPR sequence. The RNA is processed into shorter bits that each include a sequence derived from a virus. And then together with a second RNA called tracer and the protein Cas9, this RNA guided surveillance complex is able to search the cell looking for a DNA sequence that has a matching sequence to the RNA guide. And when that match occurs, the protein unwinds the DNA and cuts it, allowing the DNA to be degraded in bacteria. So this is a terrific way for these prokaryotic organisms to acquire immunity in real time as they become infected with phage. So the biology uh, here is very interesting. And, uh, and then um, as my collaborator, Emmanuel Charpentier and I were investigating the mechanism of this process, it became clear that, in, uh, that, that this double-stranded DNA cutting activity of CRISPR-Cas9 could be harnessed in a different way in plant and animal and human cells because of the way that our cells deal with double-stranded DNA breaks. And that's shown here. So in eukaryotic cells, when DNA double-stranded breaks occur, the cell can recognize the break and repair it. And in the process, introduce a small disruption to a DNA sequence or integrate a new section of DNA that incorporates new genetic material at the site of the break. And this was research that you know, had been going on for a couple of decades before CRISPR came along. And many scientists had recognized that by introducing a double-stranded break in a, in a genome, for example, in a human genome, that it was possible to change that a DNA sequence during this process of repair. However, the challenge was how to introduce a targeted double-stranded DNA break, something that 
is obviously non-trivial. There were earlier technologies for doing this that relied on programmable proteins like talons and zinc finger nucleases. However, uh, these proteins took effort to engineer and had to be redesigned for every DNA edit. And the amazing thing about CRISPR is that it's easily reprogrammed by simply changing the guide RNA. So here we're watching a video that illustrates the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, protein with its guide entering the nucleus of a uh, eukaryotic cell and then uh, surveying the sequence to identify a sequence that matches the RNA guide. And as you can see, this triggers DNA unwinding locally. It allows the two chemical active sites of the Cas9 protein to cut the DNA double helix precisely, just like you would cut a rope. And then those broken ends of DNA are handed off to repair enzymes in the cell that can fix the break by introducing a small change in the sequence, like in this example, or by integrating a new piece of DNA if there's a DNA a template uh, available in the cell. And so when Emmanuel Charpentier and I published this work in 2012, it was very quickly adopted by multiple labs around the world. And, and now uh, eight years later has actually gotten to a stage where in addition to being used widely for research, there are multiple opportunities for clinical applications that I'll discuss uh, briefly. And so, you know, the, the one thing to mention here is that uh, we're focusing on applications in medicine, but the exciting thing about CRISPR is that it's cross-cutting across essentially all areas of biology. And so we, over the last eight years, there's been incredible uh, advances in basic research, as well as uh, both medicine and agriculture that have relied on this fundamental ability to manipulate DNA in a precise and positional way in cells. And it's really opened the door to at accessing the information in the human genome and in other available uh, genomes in a way that up until that point had been difficult uh, or in some cases not really possible. So in, in clinical medicine, I wanted, I wanted to say a little bit about um, some of the incredible opportunities that are coming up for doing editing that will have an impact on patients. And I think the vast majority of this type of editing involves somatic cell editing where cells from a patient can be corrected using a, a CRISPR-based approach and then uh, used in those patients to correct their disease causing mutation. And this is, a, this is a, a, an example in the case of sickle cell disease where the mutation that causes sickle cell uh, disease has been well known for decades and it, it results from a, a single base pair change in the human beta globin gene that gives rise to a mutant form of hemoglobin that causes the, the uh, distinctive sickle shape of these cells and leads to a number of very devastating you know, physiological effects on, on patients, including organ uh, damage and, and great uh, pain and, and very difficult disease to, to manage. And, uh, it became clear really very early in the, in the whole uh, development of the CRISPR technology that this approach of CRISPR could be used to correct, either uh, correct this mutation directly or to activate a secondary gene such as fetal hemoglobin in these affected cells that would uh, mitigate the effects of the disease. And so that work, which began in culture, you know, cells that were being cultured in the laboratory has now progressed to a point where it's being uh, actually applied in patients. And this is a, a, a great uh, example of the first US patient to receive a CRISPR therapy for her sickle cell disease, Victoria Gray, um, who has made headlines over the last year and a half because she's done very well with this therapy. And, um, and so there's been a, a lot of excitement about the potential for this treatment to be truly impactful in uh, patients that are suffering from not only this disease, but many other uh, rare diseases that would otherwise typically be unaddressed uh, and very difficult to either uh, treat or in some cases even to, to diagnose. And CRISPR can, can in principle do both. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, that 
I've been working on at the Innovative Genomics Institute is how we think about a therapy like this from the standpoint of access, because although the 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 uh, the, the, the the technology is is exciting and we can see the potential to have an impact on people's lives, I think that you know to to make sure that this kind of therapy in the future is affordable uh, to people that need it is is paramount, and so that's one of the things that I'm doing uh, currently is to really work on how we can make CRISPR into a, a technology that is accessible to the largest number of people. And just for example, this uh, current therapy for CRISPR costs north of 1 million uh, US dollars per patient. So it's clearly uh, at, at a price point right now that would not be accessible to people around the world that would uh, potentially benefit from it. Another aspect of CRISPR that I wanna briefly mention here is uh, is the ethical use of a technology that in principle gives us the, the, the power to rewrite uh, you know, the human uh, genetic code in a way that could impact future generations. And so one of the, uh, one of the, the things that I've spent the last several years uh, participating in are uh, global conversations about the ethical use of CRISPR. And in particular, the, this comes up when we think about applications in the human germline, which means applying CRISPR in human embryos or uh, eggs or sperm in a way that would create heritable changes in the human genome. Something that has been uh, widely discussed and debated, and, and there's a, a, a series of reports that have been released, including the one shown here that was uh, the result of uh, an international committee led by the National Academies in the US and the Royal Society uh, in the UK. So I think this is a very important topic to continue discussing and, um, and to you know, maintain transparency around its use because there's no question that this type of research certainly is going forward. And I think in the future, there may be opportunities to use CRISPR in this fashion, but we have to make sure that the, that work proceeds with appropriate uh, guidelines and, and responsibility. Um, and so I want to just, in the last part of the lecture, I just, I want to turn to what is currently going on in uh, the research lab to address some of the ongoing challenges of CRISPR, as well as how it can be used to address uh, even the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. And, um, and I want to, I want to really talk to you briefly about three different questions that we've been posing uh, from a research perspective uh, regarding the, the accuracy and the efficiency of using CRISPR for any application, but primarily thinking about it in terms of applications in clinical uh, medicine. And the first question is, how do we ensure the precision of editing? And so we, uh, we are working on this in, in a number of different ways, but the, the a uh, short story I want to tell you today has been the result of a, a terrific collaboration with the lab of David Liu at the Broad Institute at Harvard that um, has involved investigating the, the activities of engineered forms of CRISPR-Cas9 that are capable of chemically editing an individual or a set of nucleotides in DNA that collectively are called base editors. And just as an example, and this is a figure taken from a 2017 uh, publication from the Lou Lab. This shows a collection of pathogenic human single nucleotide polymorphisms. And out of the total that were categorized here, about half of them could be corrected if it were possible to convert an AT base pair in DNA to a GC pair. And of course, doing that site specifically is, uh, is uh, a tall order. And yet, the, uh, the, the CRISPR technology is in principle capable of this kind of precision chemical modification uh, if, if it can be harnessed in, in, in the right way. And I, I'll show you very briefly the approach that uh, the Lou lab and the Condo uh, lab and others have taken to creating base editors from a, a CRISPR platform. The idea was to take the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, protein that I showed you before and make a connection, a, 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 a protein linkage to a domain of uh, uh, an enzyme over here in red that is capable of, of converting 
adenosines in DNA to inosines, which can then be converted further to guanosines when the cell goes through a round of DNA replication and DNA repair. And so this was kind of the, you know, the schematic of, yeah, wouldn't it be great if you know, this, this could happen? And the idea here was that uh, Cas9, because of its mechanism that I, as I showed you, it, it's a protein that uses the guide RNA to trigger DNA unwinding. It's catalyzed by the Cas9 protein. And then uh, in the natural setting, DNA cutting. And so in this instance, what uh, the, the, the idea was to remove the cutting ability of, of Cas9 or turn it into a nickase. So it could only cut one strand of the DNA in a fashion that would tell the cell which strand of the DNA was actually to be, was the correct uh, strand uh, for DNA repair and then allow this DNA unwinding capability to expose a sequence of DNA for editing at a particular position by this editor uh, uh, domain that was appended to Cas9. So that all sounds great. Uh, the challenge was that there's actually, or there were many challenges, but you know, one of them is that there's no natural enzyme in nature that has this chemical capability of modifying a single stranded DNA to convert and adenosine to, a, uh, to anything really, but uh, certainly not this pathway here. However, there is a domain, uh, there is an enzyme that's well known in bacteria that can do this chemistry in RNA. And this is a tRNA modifying protein called TAD-A that functions as a dimer. Uh, its structure is well known. And so the, the strategy of the, the Lu and the Kondo labs was to use directed evolution in the laboratory to introduce mutations into this TAD-A protein and then select for enzymes that would have the ability to, to do the kind of editing that I showed on the last slide. And through a number of rounds of selection, there were uh, a series of these types of chimeric editing proteins uh, that were appended to Cas9 that were evolved in this kind of laboratory setting to do uh, uh, adenosine to um, to inosine and then guanosine uh, conversion in cells. And so this was great uh, uh, from a sort of a, an, an editing you know, technology perspective. But the question was how to turn this into a, ultimately into a, a tool that would be precise enough and, and, uh, and effective enough that it would actually be useful in a clinical setting. And so this is where we started to work with the Lou Lab and, and doing uh, what, what we like to do, which is diving into the molecular mechanisms of, of enzymes. We did some time course measurements in the laboratory with purified versions of these different uh, generations of editing proteins. And we found that uh, most of them were very, very slow uh, enzymes. So this is looking at, at a, a time course here. This is a one hour uh, incubation of a purified, these purified editing proteins uh, incubating with double-stranded DNA and looking at the, the chemistry that's shown uh, here that can be detected very nicely with a, uh, using a, an endonuclease cleavage assay. And um, what was striking was that there was one uh, editing protein that hadn't at the time been very well characterized from the Lou lab called they called it ABE8E, this stands for A-base editor, eighth, uh, eighth edition, I guess. And, uh, and this, this uh, protein had markedly different uh, kinetics in vitro compared to all of these other uh, A-base editors. So we scratched our heads and said, I wonder why that is. And uh, we start, dug in to start figuring out what might be special about this particular uh, version of the A-base editor. Why was it so good? at uh, modifying adenosine in this kind of a setting. And so to, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to catch it in the act of actually editing DNA. And so this led to a, a wonderful collaboration, freeway collaboration with the lab of Peter Beal at UC Davis, who has a long history of working on the TAD-A protein from bacteria. And they had done structural biology on this and had uh, also come up with a very nice chemical strategy for trapping the TAD-A enzyme in the act of editing tRNA. And they could do this by substituting a nucleotide analog called 8 aza nebularin, which is shown here at the position of, of editing in a tRNA substrate. 
And uh, this would lead to a partial reaction in the presence of tab A that could not carry on to the, the rest of the, um, uh, you know, to actually uh, complete the chemical uh, conversion of adenosine to, to inosine. And so the idea was to synthesize DNA molecules that would contain as nebularin at different positions in this part of the DNA that we knew would become exposed uh, as a single strand during Cas9 binding, and then see if we could actually capture the editing domain of this ABE8E protein in the act of uh, editing that position. And so this was work done by a postdoc in my lab, Audrey uh, Lapinate and Cody Palumbo, a student with Pete Beal. And uh, after sort of uh, summarizing uh, two and a half years of work, they eventually did find a, a position a modification in the DNA that succeeded in, in this kind of trapping. And furthermore, we were able to capture this and visualize it using cryo-electron microscopy together. In, and this was work done by a second postdoc in the lab, uh, Gavin Knott. So Gavin and Audrey worked together to do uh, the structural biology on this protein. And I'll show you just a, a, a very short uh, animation of this. So you're looking at the, the Cas9 protein in white. The red and pink are the TAD A editing uh, protein bound to DNA. And uh, hopefully you can see that the protein is holding on to its guide RNA in magenta. The DNA is literally unwound uh, as it traverses the protein. And this is the important part. This is really the, the action uh, area of this editor is the, the loop of DNA that enters the active site of the TAD A enzyme. And I, I won't show you in detail here, but we could actually observe that the, the, uh, the eight mutations that occur in the TAD A version, this eight A, uh, eight, eighth edition uh, version of the A base, uh, base editor are all clustered in the region of TAD A that bind to DNA. And so it really was very clear that this enzyme has become uh, adapted for a DNA substrate it now precludes editing RNA. It doesn't, doesn't uh, edit RNA very well anymore, but it's, it's terrific at editing this kind of uh, looped out single-stranded DNA molecule. Um, and in fact, it's almost too good because we did find, and I won't show you these data, but they're, they're now published, that this protein is actually also editing other positions along the DNA, probably as a result of the search mechanism of Cas9, as it moves along DNA looking for a target sequence to bind uh, with its guide RNA. And so we think that there actually may be a happy medium uh, to be still discovered that will uh, identify a version of this modified editing domain that will be uh, still fast and effective at editing DNA, but not so fast that it is able to, to uh, capture transiently melted DNA during the Cas9 search process. So this is a, an illustration of how understanding the molecular mechanism of these types of proteins can in fact uh, guide the direction and development of a technology like this. I also want to point out that in nature, there are a number of alternative proteins to the Cas9 uh, protein that Emmanuel Charpentier and I first investigated. And we've been interested in, in, in finding these and uh, understanding how they, how they work. And this has been a long time collaboration with a colleague of mine at Berkeley, Jillian Banfield, who researches uh, bacteria primarily uh, growing in uh, various environmental settings. And she's one of the, the international leaders in metagenomic sequencing, which means collecting bacterial samples, sequencing all of the DNA in the samples, and then reassembling genomes from those data to identify what organisms might uh, have been growing in those settings. And of course, in the in the, in the uh, context of this type of work, they also identify bacteriophage that are infecting these organisms. And that was actually one of the, she was one of the early labs to identify CRISPR sequences based on that type of work. And so very recently, um, we've been working with her laboratory on a fascinating subset of CRISPR-Cas systems that are found only in phage. So one of the you know, surprises here is that an antiphage uh, mechanism, of course, has been picked up by phage and uh, we think is being utilized by some phage, at least, to uh, target their phage competitors. 
And one of these proteins is a protein that we call Cas C because this is a protein that is about half the size of the uh, of the, the original CRISPR Cas protein. It's about a 70 kilodalton protein. And it's in a very small uh, CRISPR locus. It has a, just a single, uh, this one gene together with a, a CRISPR array of sequences. And um, it has a, just a, a short uh, guide RNA that it utilizes for DNA targeting. And so in work that was done with uh, Bassem al Shayev, a, a graduate student, and Patrick Kausch, a postdoc, we were able to uh, start characterizing this CRISPR-Cas3 system, we found that this system is in fact the smallest uh, so far that's been identified in terms of its total molecular weight compared to any of these other uh, CRISPR-Cas type systems. And yet remarkably, it's still capable of uh, not only targeted double-stranded DNA cutting, but also of inducing genome editing in human cells using a very simple uh, assay that we can, where we can identify and quickly sort cells that have been edited based on targeting of a green fluorescent protein encoding uh, gene in these cells. And this is just showing some quantification of different guide RNAs that work in these cells. And so we've been, uh, since this work was initiated, we've been uh, continuing to investigate how this very small protein is nonetheless capable of DNA unwinding, DNA cutting, and, uh, and, and triggering this kind of uh, editing in, in eukaryotic cells. And so recently, Patrick Pausch and another uh, postdoc in the lab, Kasha Seltzek, have been using cryo-electron microscopy to capture the Cas3 protein in, in, uh, in different structural states. And I'll just show you one image here of the protein. So we know that this, we now know from this work that uh, the protein is, hugs the, the nucleic acid very, very tightly, it sort of wraps around the, the guide RNA, which is in orange in this image and the, the targeted DNA. And we can see now in detail how the DNA is recognized by this protein. We have some important clues about how DNA unwinding is triggered in these enzymes, these very small proteins. And uh, we also have some data showing that uh, these proteins are, are naturally inhibited from cutting DNA randomly by a structure that when removed makes these uh, enzymes even more active than they are in nature. So this is something we're currently exploring and I think is, um, again, illustrates the value of having this kind of mechanistic and structural data that we can use to understand the natural functions of proteins like this and then um, and then uh, engineer them to do new things uh, as needed for a technology development. And then finally, I wanted to briefly address this question. How can CRISPR-Cas editing enzymes be delivered to specific cell types? Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> I think this is the big uh, current bottleneck, honestly, in the CRISPR field is, is really figuring out how to do this. I don't think there's likely to be a one size fits all answer to it, but um, clearly having better ways to deliver these editors into tissues and cell types selectively is going to be key. And just as, a, as an example, going back to, the, to the, the, uh, the story of Victoria Gray and other patients who have been treated using CRISPR, right now that treatment requires bone marrow transplantation. And in those studies so far, the, 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 uh, the uh, primary health, uh, negative health impacts on those patients have been a result of the bone marrow transplant rather than apparently anything to do with the genome editing. So it just speaks to the importance of figuring out safe ways to deliver these uh, types of molecules in different settings. And so what we're doing to address this right now is really thinking about ways that we can package the CRISPR protein with its guide RNA for delivery. And, um, and I wanted to just point out this paper from last year from Carol June's lab that was again, uh, you know, one of the, one of the uh, highlights of, of, of last year in terms of developments in the CRISPR field because it really showed the potential to use CRISPR engineered T cells in patients uh, who are suffering from cancer and highlights the, the future potential of this kind of a strategy. And as shown in this image, uh, this type of T cell engineering today involves, again, ex vivo editing. So the 
cells are removed from a patient, the editing goes on in the lab and then uh, the edited cells are, are returned to the patient. And so we've been thinking about this and wondering if there might be an alternative in the future. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to do all of this and you had a way to uh, provide a, a, one, a one and done injection or who knows, maybe someday even a pill that could, could be taken that would um, deliver the editors to just to the cells where editing is, is necessary. And so this is a project being conducted by uh, Jenny Hamilton and Abby Stahl, two postdocs in the lab, and Connor Sushita, a, a bioengineering graduate student. And the approach they are taking is to use virus-like particles as nice uh, little packages for capturing assembled CRISPR-Cas9 proteins with guide RNAs. And, then, and the important thing here is that we can take advantage of the glycoproteins on the capsid surface for de delivery into cells because this is effectively the, the viral infection mechanism. Importantly here, these virus-like particles have been gutted of genes that would allow virus uh, replication. So they, they're not infectious in that sense, but they're able to transduce uh, particular cell types and dump their contents into the cells. And so the way, this, uh, the way that we're doing this, and, and this has been a, a terrific collaboration with some additional scientists at UCSF in the lab of Alex Marson, in particular, David Nyan and, and Brian Shai, two MD PhDs who are focused on um, T cell engineering for, for immunology applications. And uh, the strategy here is to use a, uh, it's kind of a, a one-two punch where we have Cas9 protein RNAs. So these are uh, ribonucleoproteins or RNPs that target genes important for uh, this type of a T cell engineering approach together with a lentiviral uh, genome that encodes a second uh, 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 a piece of DNA that can target another gene, in this case, uh, in a, a uh, anti-CD19, which is cell surface receptor, uh, chimeric antigen uh, receptor uh, protein, gene encoding this protein. And so the idea here is to use the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system to target and knock out particular genes and at the same time allow integration of a new gene that can create that chimeric antigen receptor so useful for, uh, for uh, T cell therapies. And so this is very briefly a summary of the strategy. And so what we can do is to encode in addition to genes important for uh, creating these lentiviral capsids, we actually encode a chimeric gag protein that's been fused to Cas9. And this is important because when these plasmids are transfected into cells, uh, they create these kinds of particles in which the Cas9 protein is anchored to the capsid. So this ensures uh, accurate in, uh, or effective, efficient in, uh, encapsulation together with uh, guide RNA. And then there's a proteolytic cleavage site that allows clipping of this assembled Cas9 off of the interior surface so that these are released uh, inside the capsid. And so we, uh, I'll just show you a couple of, um, of data points here. And so that we're, we're able to use these, this type of a strategy to get pretty robust uh, expression of this chimeric antigen receptor in these targeted cells. And, um, and we can quantify this in different ways. So this is showing uh, uh, quantification of two different uh, types of T cells, these CD4 positive cells and CD8 positive cells uh, shown here. And importantly, we can also engineer the capsid of these virus-like particles to target just one uh, type of T cell. And so this is an experiment in which it was possible to selectively target just the CD4 positive cells in a mixture of cells that also contain uh, CD8 positive cells. And so we think this is a strategy that in the future it has real potential to allow a targeted editing of just uh, those cells that will be clinically beneficial in a patient while leaving all the bystanders, uh, standard uh, cells unmodified. And then finally, just, want, uh, just wanted to mention also that uh, we have a, a lot of interest in applying this, uh, this strategy of protein RNA delivery in, you know, for genome editing in the brain. And that sounds like a, like a high bar, and it certainly is, uh, but I think there's such an important uh, unmet medical need right now for uh, treating patients that have neurodegenerative disease that we're even very interested in this. And 
This is actually a project that started several years ago in the lab with the work of a former uh, postdoc, Brett Stahl, who came in and, and was able to show that he could engineer Cas9 with uh, peptides that were appended to the protein surface that allow cell penetration. And so this was a kind of a direct uh, protein delivery strategy where these engineered Cas9 and guide RNAs are injected across the blood brain barrier. This is a, an experiment conducted in a mouse uh, using a reporter mouse where editing leads to cells that are red. And so it's very easy to see cells that become edited. And you can see a nice kind of dose response here that the higher uh, the amount of injected engineered Cas9, the more uh, editing is observed. And since then, uh, we've been able to improve the kind of steadily improve the efficiency of this and, uh, and, and achieve really quite uh, decent levels of editing again in the mouse. Um, we're, we're still uh, investigating how this would work in a, in a larger brain, like in a, in, a, in a larger sort of animal brain. But, uh, but I think the principle here is that we, we think that this will be a useful strategy for, especially for targeted delivery, where um, there's a de desire to edit cells in just one region of the brain, for example, the kind of therapy that might be useful for treating something like Parkinson's disease. Um, and then I'm just one final slide. I wanted to mention uh, uh, CRISPR and coronavirus. It's a little bit hard to, uh, you know, sort of imagine uh, the, 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 the uh, complexities of the, the past year for, for everybody really around the world. But um, when the pandemic was just uh, getting started in the US um, just about a year ago, we realized at the Innovative Genomics Institute that uh, there were some, some really uh, important things that we could do as an institute to address this emergency. And one of the things we did was to set up a clinical testing lab, uh, just using a you know, standard PCR-based technology. But that's been incredibly important because we're now a, a clinically approved laboratory that uh, is able to test all of the samples from people across our university campus, as well as we work with a number of healthcare partners in Northern California that has allowed us to provide regular testing for people that would otherwise not have access to it. For example, folks that are, uh, that are unsheltered, uh, folks that are first responders of various kinds. We've worked with a number of our fire departments and police uh, departments to provide them with regular testing. And, um, and in the process of doing that, we also realized that CRISPR uh, could have an important role to play in testing and diagnostics as well based on uh, some interesting chemistry that emerged from the lab, from our lab uh, several years ago now, starting with a graduate student, East, uh, Alexandra Isteletsky, who first uh, showed that you could use the activities of some proteins, in particular, a type of protein called CRISPR-Cas13 that is naturally an RNA targeting form of CRISPR, um, to report on the presence of a sequence. And that very briefly, the way this chemistry works is that these, what Alexandra uh, E. Selesky showed is that these proteins naturally have uh, an ability to recognize RNA with an RNA guided mechanism. So very analogous to what I showed you for Cas9, except that in this case, recognition of a sequence turns on a non-specific RNA cutting activity that will cut any uh, single-stranded RNA in the vicinity of this enzyme. And so she realized this was uh, also published at a similar time by uh, Gutenberg and Feng Zhang. But what Alexandra recognized was that she could use this activity to report on the presence of a sequence if she had a quenched fluorophore pair of dyes that were coupled to single-stranded RNA. And so this uh, was a, uh, this is a reaction then that upon activation by recognizing a target, this enzyme starts cutting the reporter and releasing fluorescent signal that can be easily detected. And this fundamental strategy has now become uh, uh, widely adopted by a number of labs and companies. There are second, a second class of enzymes called CRISPR-Cas12 that have a similar capability except uh, for DNA recognition. So they have a a DNA cutting activity that gets turned on upon binding to, to DNA sequences. And so this is a great way to use CRISPR as a diagnostic tool. And so we've been, uh, we've been uh, recently, this is a very recent publication that um, is from the lab of Melanie Ott at the Gladstone, one of our long, another one of our longtime collaborators. 
to use CRISPR as a tool for detecting viruses. And you may know the coronavirus is an RNA virus. So having a te technology that can directly detect RNA without having to go through a, a, a DNA uh, you know, step where you have to uh, copy the RNA into DNA has some real advantages in terms of quantification as well as speed of the test. And so that work is uh, very much uh, very actively uh, under development. And in fact, we're excited that at our clinical testing lab, we're just about to start using a CRISPR-based uh, laboratory test for uh, coronavirus that will begin uh, with one of the beta test sites for a local company that's been developing the technology. And we'll see how it works with our uh, robotic pipeline in the clinical lab. Um, yeah, so I just want to wrap up there and, and just point out that, you know, I think uh, continued mechanistic dissection of these systems will guide the further development of fast and accurate genome editing proteins. We think that continued discovery of new genome editors, including those that are very small and compact, will give us new strategies clinically, especially for delivery. And finally, that um, figuring out better ways to deliver these proteins, especially in situ will be uh, fundamental to the to the um, you know the continued advance of this as a as a real uh, clinical therapy for lots of other uh, diseases in the future. I want to thank a great team. This is obviously a pre-pandemic uh, photograph, including all of my I think I had 15 uh, undergraduate students that were uh, working in the lab that summer. So this is a, this is a, showing the entire team here, and I just want to give a shout out to. Our, uh, our original work with Emmanuel Charpentier with Martin Yinek and Chris Chylinski, who did the work on Cas9 originally, our labs at uh, Berkeley and Gladstone that are doing the, the research that I talked about today from, from our group, as well as our collaborators, Alex Marson, Melniot, and also uh, Bruce Conklin at the Gladstone Institutes. And of course, all of this is made possible by support from uh, these agencies here. Thank you very much. And of course, I'll be uh, delighted to address uh, questions that you might have. Thank you, Jennifer. Wow. Uh, so humbling and inspiring all at once, it, illustrating fantastically the combination of biochemistry and structural biology coming through to that understanding to lead to the advance. We've got, um, we've got quite a few questions and we've got a uh, good 10 minutes. Um, so, Many of them that you, you well, came in early, you've asked, um, you've already answered in your presentation about how might it help in cancer. Um, there's one of the common questions: what 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 would be one of your what would be your main concern, if any, going forward for the future of of using CRISPR um, technology? Um. Well, I guess I have, I have two. One is, one is that I, I think that, you know, as exciting as it's seen to, as it's been to see the, the rapid advances, I think there's also a, you know, needs to be appropriate caution with a new technology. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that as these, especially clinical trials advance, that, um, that there's, you know, there's appropriate sort of restraint, I guess, to make sure that we don't get ahead of the technology. I think so far that's been true and I, I've been pleased and I, I, I hope that that continues. And the other thing I'll mention briefly that I, you know, I do, I do think about and I, I feel uh, some uh, uh, angst about is the accessibility, as I mentioned. I think that you know, for this technology to really become impactful uh, for people who need it, it will need to it really come down in cost and it needs to become much more accessible. And that, that's gonna require not only delivery approaches, but also ensuring that, of course, it's uh, accurate and safe and effective and, um, you know, that, uh, that, that, it, um, that it can be tested uh, safely uh, in, you know, for many different applications, which is another challenge. I didn't talk about it, but if you think about it, also is an interesting challenge for a technology like this. Yeah. One of the questions was, um, how do you direct um, the therapeutic to specific cells? And again, you address that. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done there, but um, it, it looks as if it started and, and, and will be really important to get cell specificity on delivery. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I, I, I think the approach taken again illustrated how sophisticated and, and how much thought goes into engineering to get that specificity. That was really impressive. Um, 
one one of the I know microbiome sequencing has taken off BGI, the Million Human Microbiome Project. But of course, what's waiting in the wings is is the characterization of probably of millions of more phage. Uh, so it 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 uh, again you you mentioned this. It seems almost unlimited functionality in in all the phage that we've yet to discover. It's, yeah. it's Kind of mind blowing, isn't it? I mean, it just, is mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, I hear this regularly from my my colleague Jillian Banfield, who does this work. You know, she's always telling me, Jennifer, we're just at the very, very tip of the iceberg, and the iceberg is huge. So, <laughs> yeah, and um, th there was one question about is is there any possibility of uh, anti drug antibody responses? So the the host immune system reacts against one of the proteins that's been brought in. Yeah. That's a very important question, and 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 uh, and abs and the answer is, is absolutely yes. And there there are several publications already that you know show the potential for that for that. Um, of course, you know we're using a foreign protein here, right? So you can imagine that could be Im immunogenic. And not only that, but you know the the uh, most commonly used form of CRISPR, the CRISPR Cas9 protein, is from a, it comes from a, um, a pathogenic bacterium that many of us already have antibodies to. Uh, and so you could imagine that that could also be problematic in, you know, in people. It's not been demonstrated to be the case, but it's something that you know, I think re requires careful, careful uh, attention. Um, we, we have a collaboration with a couple of, couple of uh, immunology labs at Berkeley who have been looking at this question. And so they have, in working in a mouse model, they have found that uh, yes, indeed, that the, the, not surprisingly, that these bacterial proteins are immunogenic, but also that they can identify the immunogenic epitopes on the surface of these proteins. And um, they've been starting to engineer them to be, uh, you know, to be sort of humanized in ways that people have done effectively for antibodies. So I think that, you know, there may be opportunities there. And then also, I didn't mention it, but the other, one of our other motivations for studying these alternative CRISPR-Cas systems is that if they come from uh, phage that you know have never uh, that, you know infect uh, bacteria that have nothing to do with human physiology, then we think that they may actually be intrinsically safer because they won't they won't be pre-existing antibodies in people. For this. Yeah, and um, the, the the same group published a very nice science paper recently. That the same group that developed in Germany developed the the, the Pfizer messenger yeah. RNA. And they, they, the title of the paper is a non-inflammatory non messenger RNA to a, not, to a cell antigen. So in parallel, there'll be better ways of tolerizing you to the key proteins that, that you guys and others develop. Um, my, my colleague, Peter Donnelly, who was the former director of the Welcome Center here in Oxford and also co-chair of, 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 of the CPM, he's, he's asked a question, the human genome is a big one. How how does how does the Cas9 system find its sequence? <laughs> that is such a great question. I would love to know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I mean that's you know um, I actually just I just hired a, a new postdoc from the lab of Zhao Wei Zhuang, uh, one of the you know really top uh, um, imaging laboratories who does single mole molecule imaging. We're hoping to start to dissect this by doing some live cell imaging. Um, but right now there, there are a handful of publications about this and you know there've been some work, we, we did some work a few years ago with the lab of Bob Tijan on this topic where it's possible to put a fluorescent label on Cas9 and then kind of watch its you know, movements around uh, cell nuclei. But those experiments so far have just uh, kind of told us the outer boundaries of you know, how, this, how this works. We don't know yet in detail uh, how how it actually finds a target. And one of the, here's, I'll just leave you with an interesting conundrum. And that is that, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, potential uh, sites of targeting for Cas9 in a cell. And if it's spent too long on any one of those, you could imagine it would literally never ever have time to get to its true target. So this has to be a very, very fast uh, protein and um, understanding how that works, I think is still really a fundamental aspect of the field. Wow, and, and, and it looks as if with the latest technology, you can image it as it travels across a genome. Yes, 
Yeah, so I think there's a lot of opportunity there now with the breakthroughs in imaging technology for sure. Yeah. Um, so um, maybe going back to the very beginning, um, somebody's asked of, of the several CAS enzymes, 12, 6, 13, 9, how did, how did you settle on nine? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a, yeah, that's another good one. Um, well, I have to I have to uh, give a shout out to Emmanuel uh, Charpentier here because um, that that work really initiated when she and I met at a conference, and she had been already investigating uh, this CRISPR system in Streptococcus pyogenes uh, in an infectious uh, bacterium that infects humans and um, trying to figure out how its CRISPR system was working. And it, it used a, a Cas9 based system. And at that time, my lab had been doing work on other types of CRISPR proteins, but not that one. And she said, you know, I think, I think Cas9 is a, you know, it's a very, it's clearly very important uh, genetically in these cells, but we don't know what it does biochemically. So if you wanna work together to figure it out. And, uh, you know, that's how we got into it. But it was clear from already at the, in the field at the time that there, that there was something very, very interesting about a single protein, Cas9, that had this, R, somehow, this RNA targeting capability uh, where it could, you know, recognize a DNA sequence and cut it. It's just that nobody understood the mechanism. And that's where we got involved in. Yeah, and, and related to that, I guess, I mean, is there a Cas24 when you characterized, presumably there's millions of bacteria that remain to be bound and sequenced. Yeah, well, uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of diversity of CRISPR systems for sure. I think what's emerged so far in the field is that um, the Cas12 uh, family of proteins that I, I mentioned it just very briefly, but that turns out to be uh, quite a large uh, super family of different flavors of those oh. Cas12 proteins. So th that's been kind of expanding over time. Uh, whether there'll be a, yeah, is there going to be a, you know, a CAS 15, 16, 17, 18, 24, 58? I don't know. I, my guess right now is probably not, but if they're, if they are there, they'll be rare, I think, you know, but again, yeah. I got to remember that, you know, we're, we're at the tip of this, you know, huge iceberg of, of, uh, of bacteria. So what else is out there? Yeah, we don't know yet. And of course, uh, another impressive feature was that, that evolution in the laboratory, searching for variants that do what you want of the existing cast genes. I mean, that, 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 that also was incredible. So we're, um, we've got through the questions. Um, mate, we've got, I'll, I'll ask you one more, like, um, when you must give this seminar a lot, what, what, what's the toughest question you're asked? Well, I think, I think the, I, I guess I would say two tough ones are, um, are about ethics. So no, nobody asked in this uh, uh, seminar about, you know, editing uh, human embryos, but, you know, that's one that's been on many people's mind. You know, do we have to worry about uh, rogue use of, of CRISPR-Cas? And my answer there is uh, yes, <laughs> but I but I think that uh, you know the potential of the technology is so huge and it's so important that we don't want to slow it down. We just want to make sure that we um, you know I think the global scientific community needs to be making a strong stand about you know how we want to see the technology proceed. And I think that's been happening. So I, I'm you know when there's never a I don't think there's ever a way to enforce uh, global regulations. We have hard time even doing that in, in, in particular countries. But, um, but I do think that having um, some clear criteria that are agreed to by authorities worldwide is, is really helpful. And that's what's been happening with that. Um, the other, the other uh, tough question, I guess, is about patents and intellectual yes. property. So nobody asked about that either. Yeah, uh, there, there is a question on that, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, you know, and I think I think the the challenge there is that um, you know this is a technology that I think all of us I, I think would want to see adopted as widely as possible, right? And you know, and and uh, and developed as quickly as, as possible to be beneficial to the largest number of people. And uh, and the question is always how to how to do that in, you know appropriately and 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 to allow investors who might be developing com commercial 
ventures to recover their investments, which is really the purpose of the patenting system. And so, um, you know, I've, I've really been pleased that the science, I think, of CRISPR has continued to develop quite, you know, quite quickly independent of the, the ongoing patent disputes, which um, unfortunately I think are going to, we're going to, those are going to be with us for a while. You know, they're going to yeah. go on, on and on and on and lawyers are going to, are going to be the winners there for sure. Um, but, you know, but I think, I think fortunately the science and, and the application of it continues apace. And so yeah. um, this, this is really key to keep in mind is that, you know, when you read about the latest in the patent fights in the media, remember that, you know, labs worldwide are continuing to do their work and this is not slowing any of it down. All right, we've reached six o'clock UK time. Um, thank you very much indeed. Fantastic, thanks.